Hey everyone, this is Mike Dunn, and you are listening to Rethinking EDU. I really appreciate you being here today, taking the time to listen to our podcast as always. And this is one of our uh, knowledge drop episodes where one of us individual co-hosts sits down with a guest and talks about some related topic to education. Without further ado, let's get into it. So I'm sitting down here with Henry Fairfax. Henry is the head of school at the Revolution School here in Philadelphia. Henry, how are you feeling this fine afternoon? I'm feeling all right. I got a walk in this morning. Uh, My wife and I are challenging each other on on the Apple Watch and she's beating me right now today. So I'm not too fired up about that. But other than that, I'm good. My teenagers are asleep. I have a two or three and a six year old and they are they're out of the house. They're at my in-laws. And, uh, oh, they actually, nice. They were at my in-laws during the day because we couldn't work and mm-hmm. have them running around, storming around the house. And so they were great. My in-laws were great to, to look after them. And then they fired us. So, oh, my gosh. Uh, <laughs> send them yeah, back they, home. <laughs> they, sent them, they sent them back home. So uh, so they do. They help out on Thursday and Friday. So it makes it a little easier for us to, to work and have good conversations like this. Yeah, that's that's really nice. And I'm very thankful and appreciative of you taking a little bit of time to chat with us. Um, you know, Rethinking EDU is all about uh, connecting with individuals and groups and networks that are thinking about schools in innovative ways, and then also doing that work, you know, trying to figure out how we can actually like get into schools and make not just a little change, although little change is is super important, um, also making transformational change, right? Really trying to rethink whole school models. Like how Mm -hmm. can we fundamentally be doing school differently? And Mm -hmm. if you're listening out there, you may have heard our last couple episodes with the uh, Rural Schools Collaborative and the I Am A Rural Teacher Campaign and also with Big Picture Learning. And those groups are really trying to transform education Um, I think in important ways. And Henry, you're doing similar work here with the Revolution School in in Philadelphia. So can you just give our listeners a little bit of a description about like uh, what they, what they might see when they're experiencing the Revolution School? Sure. Uh, You know, I'll give a special shout out to my team um, in place now is a gentleman by the name of Mike Pardee. He was at Lab Atlanta, uh, a semester school in Atlanta, very similar to Revolution. Uh, Deb Borden spent some time at Shipley and also at Rosemont School of Holy Child. Uh, Jane Shore is our head of research and innovation and runs the school of thought. We can talk a little bit about that. Um, mm. You know, it's really great to have that function on your team so that you're validating your model and finding connections with everything that you're doing. Um, mm-hmm. And so that, that's been that's been tremendous. But recently uh, on a call, they came up with something I thought was actually pretty brilliant. So our core values um, spell out the word Jedi. Okay. Um, So (laughs) uh, I usually start uh, by sharing our, you know, our, our work at revolution really being about breaking down the walls between learning and life. Um, Mm -hmm. So this idea of Jedi, they, you know, they speak to our core values. So the J is that we really start everything with joy. We want Mm -hmm. our students to show up every day, excited about what they're learning and the projects that they're, that they're working on. We're a, place-based, project-based school. And so we try to make learning as sticky as possible. And uh, we think we can do that really well in projects that are relevant. Uh, and so, you know, we, we try to make the learning environment really joyous. And so that's the J. Uh, the, excuse me, the E is about empowering. Um, you know, we work hard to make sure that our students feel empowered and we raise up their voice. Uh, you know, a couple examples of that is when we went around went about the process of hiring staff faculty. I don't like to separate the staff and the faculty. So I put the word together. It's not a real, like real word. I actually stole it from a mentor from the uh, uh, Institute for New Heads. But I um, we went about the process of uh, hiring new staff faculty for this year. We thought it was important to, to engage our students in a process. So we actually appointed, I appointed a student to the uh, hiring committee uh, to you know have their voice shared and represent you know, the students in terms of what, you know, what we should be looking for and, you know, what would make their experience richer, um, you know, and so that, that was great. It was, a, I think, a professional learning opportunity for our students, but it was also an opportunity for us to learn as a team 
um, you know, and, and it gave a lens and a perspective I think is really important. Um, we doubled down on that uh, with our scenario planning work. Uh, with the scenario planning, uh, we we also invited a, a student to be a part of that. Uh, so we we try to walk the talk. So if we say we want it to be empowering and we're going to do things and put things in place to make that happen, I also think that's really important culture work. Um, I think I've become a little bit of a culture geek in the last few years of my career. Um, I just think that's really important. You, you, you're never gonna get a second chance to establish culture. So we work really hard at that. Um, so that's the J and the E. The D is really something that I think is uh, resonant with everyone right now, and that's diversity. Uh, we mean diversity in all forms, um, you know, and so we started the school year this year with 16 students from 15 different zip codes. Um, I'd like to say that the breakdown of student uh, was intentional. We got really lucky. Um, in terms of just how diverse we were. And I tell you, you know, initially it was a it was a bragging point for us. And what you realize, especially in a scrappy startup environment, is that you're gonna be pushed and challenged when you, you know, build an authentically diverse learning community. Um, you know, kids that are coming from different, you know, spaces and places. Uh, if you are uh, living in a certain zip code and you have access to a, a, a you know, quality education, um, I think that's that's great, but if you're in a zip code that you know is, is in a losing ground um, school district, it's quite possible that uh, that those challenges are going to show up when you you know when you get to the teaching and learning. And I think we right. saw a little bit of that this year, um, and so we've evolved. Uh, but diversity is huge for us, and again, I, I mean mm -hmm. that in all forms. And then the last is I. Uh, we're integrated, you know, so our projects take all the disciplines. The, core content in math and science and English and history this year, Spanish and art, and uh, we dump them into projects. And uh, we feel like if we do that, you know, kids learn by doing. So it becomes really relevant, really connected to the real world. The kids are able to see and uh, understand the why behind what they're learning, which is a big question that kids ask. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's, that's a really good way to kind of level set what we're about. We're breaking down the walls between learning and life, and it's all about Jedi. That's awesome. <laughs> I, I love, uh, well, I'm a Star Wars nerd. And so I love that acronym as a way to relate to what kids are experiencing. I'm sure the kids really like that too, you know, and uh, you can relate those values to students. Um, I think that's super important. I think one thing, at least in my view, that schools often lose out on is they've got their set of values that speak to their board and that speak to their, you know, staffalty as you, as you put it. Um, but sometimes those values don't really speak to the students, you know, yeah. students really struggle to wrap their minds around like, you know, uh, I don't know what's, what's a common core value is like being a, a leader for social justice. Like, what is that? That's like a meaty term and really challenging for students to understand, you know, but learning with joy, that's really right there at a student level. And right. it's, it's um, I think it's a really important question to ask young people is like, how are you experiencing joy in your learning? Uh, and that's, a, that's kind of a, 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 a mind shift for a student. But if that value was like overwrought with, you know, education jargon, I think students would get um, a little, a little bit more lost. So I appreciate that. Well, no, I, I appreciate uh, the reflection and feedback. But again, I got to give special shout out to, to our team. Um, sure. They came up yeah. two weeks ago. So our core values were always what I shared. Mm -hmm. I didn't put it in that form, right? And so it's easier to digest and, you know, easier to remember that way. Um, and I think our kids have done a tremendous job with it. And we try to espouse those core values in, in all we do. And I think, you know, what's, what's been really refreshing is our board has been tremendous and, mm -hmm. you know, their reaction to and engagement in our work and in our building. Um, again, as a scrappy startup, a lot of the operational stuff ends up in, in the seat of the, you know, a couple of the board members. So, um, yeah. so that's, that's been pretty refreshing that that give and take is, is happening. You mentioned earlier that you were 16 students strong. Um, that's, I would describe that as a micro school. Would you yeah. also use that term? Uh, that's fine. Boutique, micro, um, small and mighty, for sure. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I'll tell you what, intentional. Um, again, mm. back to that all around culture building. Um, you know, we, when we started, there were a lot of conversations about the enrollment model 
and, you know, the idea of scaling. And I think, you know, whether it's in education or, you know, building widgets, you can't scale too fast, right? You yeah. got to prove the model, you got to validate your model. And I think we've been really intentional about staying small on purpose. Um, I think what the pandemic has done is made us especially attractive because we're small and we're nimble, right? Mm -hmm. So now, you know, in our projects, we have the ability to be virtual and to shift and pivot our, our program on a dime, but also, you know, because we have small numbers, we can move around, right? Literally yeah, yeah, move yeah. around. And, you know, part of what we do is we use the city of Philadelphia as a classroom. Our building is at 3033 West Glenwood. We share a space with uh, the great community partnership school that's doing amazing work in, 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 in their community. And, you know, their name says it all um, in terms mm -hmm. of their partnerships. And so um, we were able to, you know, partner with them and share a space. Well, you know, right off of 33rd Street in Fairmount Park is the Discovery Center. Um, and mm -hmm. so the space that, you know, we're talking to about, you know, using as a huddle, you know, alley point, you know, for, for, for student learning it gives us a chance to have that social emotional connection that kids are clamoring for right now. Um, you know, we were sure. able to, we were able to develop a plan quicker in a scenario planning process because we're smaller. Um, and so what we're looking to do this year, I think, you know, ultimately we'd be somewhere between 20 and 25 students between ninth, 10th and 11th grade. We have an mm -hmm. 11th grade um, you know, and so we do vertical grouping. Um, there's tremendous learning that can happen, you know, and, and one of the things that I shared, to, you know, make it easy for folks to digest is, you know, when you go off and work in the real world, you're not going to work with all 30 year olds, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, the juniors have an opportunity to uh, be in a leadership role. The, you know, the, the ninth graders have a chance to learn from, you know, learn from the sophomores and, and juniors. And I think there's just a lot of rich work that can happen uh, when you do that vertical group and model and, and a, another example of us being nimble and agile um, you, you, you have to do some differentiated learning of course in mm -hmm. that scenario but um, I think when you have a really strong team you know I'm, I'm a big uh, advocate of the idea that the people are the program uh, so we you know we put heavy priority and heavy investment in the people over anything uh, because those are the folks that are in front of the students and, and interacting with the students on a consistent basis. So, um, so we have that ability, we have that skill set and the talent to be able to do different differentiation, uh, you know, um, so that the vertical group can go, go well. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I, um, just finished a, a, like, I would say fire hose style uh, course at University of Pennsylvania a couple weeks ago called the New School Models Design uh, Studio with a with a professor um, named Dr. Tyler Thigpen from the Forest School, which is down in Atlanta, and um, it was an incredible experience. And there's a lot of the a lot of parallels between Revolution and the school idea that I was incubating during the week. You know, I love the idea of a boutique school for just the things that you're suggesting, right? You can be super intentional about your groupings with students. You can be super intentional about the students that are joining your community. You can also be super intentional about the teammates that you're bringing on um, and really making that, that uh, that model work with that small group of students because you know the the idea is that like like all educators i'm sure you're interested in serving as many students as possible but there's not a whole lot of uh well there are quite a few models out there that are working and working really well right but then when you start to scale those things up stuff becomes messy so you got to have your core values and your core practices your signature learning experiences like really down before you start to scale up. And uh, probably about four or five episodes ago, we talked with Ron Berger, who um, works for Expeditionary Learning Schools or EL Education. And he talked about at one point, they, EL was getting lots of opportunities to bring in more funding because folks like Gates were saying, we want you to expand your model. You're working in high poverty areas with students that are really, really struggling in school and you're doing a good job, let's replicate that all over. And Ron said EL had to kind of take a step back and say, 
we're scaling too fast here, you know, because we're not getting it right. And I would love to hear your thoughts about that. I think, I think Ron's absolutely right. I mean, you know, you can hurry up and get it wrong, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Was, you know, what I've observed and, you know, perhaps this is my back, background as a hooper. Um, you know, my coach used to say all the time, run, but don't hurry, mm-hmm. right? And so what he was communicating to us is that we had to play with a sense of urgency, but not sloppy, right? We had to be organized. We had to be thoughtful. We had to be intentional so that we could execute. And I think similarly in the space of education, you know, you're going to have funders that come in and say, oh, you got to scale, scale, scale. And you'll, you'll water down your, your, uh, your, your model in, in that scenario. And, and, you know, when I think it's great for uh, folks in other industries to cross pollinate and engage what's happening in education. I think education should interact with the finance world. Um, but I think the learning should be genuine and it, it should be, you know, uh, reciprocal, right? So, you know, there's a lot of the financial industry or the corporate world can learn from education and vice versa. And I think that's part of the inspiration for School of Thought. Um, I think School of Thought does a wonderful job of sharing our model and sharing, you know, different ways that, you know, we're doing what we're doing as a school and uh, finding those connections and connectivity with, you know, some of the things that are happening outside the world of education and bringing that closer to. And I think that's, uh, I think that's really important. Um, but there's no doubt that I, I'd have to agree with Ron that you can hurry up and get it wrong. And for us, you know, if you, you ask me today, you know, we, we could theoretically go to 40 students next year. Right. I think we should, I think we should be no more than 25. Hmm. After, you know, the, the year after, I think we could be at 40. And then, you know, after four years, I think we could be, be at 60. And then we can scale up after that because we will have an opportunity to validate and prove our model and our founding class will head off to either starting their own business or Harvard or Westchester or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and most importantly, when they get there, they're going to be, they're going to be able to, to really engage and, and, you know, be impactful and, and make a difference in, in the space that they in, in, inhabit. So that's, it. that's really exciting, um, you know, for us. And, and I think I'd have to agree with that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about you. So you work at this really cool little boutique school in, in Philadelphia. How did you get there? <laughs> you, you, you can't make this stuff up. I was, uh, right. <laughs> I'll tell you that this is my first boutique school. Um, okay. I, spent, I spent most of my career at schools, basically a thousand plus, and, uh, mm. you know, independent schools um, professionally. And uh, larger, you know, larger operations and larger, larger organizations, and I've, I've benefited from them um, because I, you know, I know how to, you know, know how to soup is made, if you will. Yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, incredible context. I thought I'd spend my career in that in that you know context. Um, and so, you know, here's here's what happened. Um, you know, during my time as vice president of institutional advancement and enrollment management, you know, I was constantly trying to think of how do you make your school a community partner hmm. and so that was at gerard college right yes yeah, so it was at gerard yeah. college for scholarship independent boarding school for uh economically disadvantaged youth functional hmm. orphans so the parents can't be married and living in the same household um and so hmm. that, that's admission at gerard and just a wonderful beautiful mission um and so they've been around 170 years and uh so my time there was really about trying to figure out you know, okay, how do we advance the mission? You know, and that was in my role as institutional advancement. And I thought partnership, and I know there's a lot of talk about partnerships in education. Sure. And I thought Gerard was right for partnerships. And, you know, one of the uh, conversations that I had was with a gentleman by the name of Keith Wilkerson, who was at A Better Chance. Um, mm-hmm. He was in the, the region, um, mid-Atlantic region of A Better Chance. And I called him and I said, hey, what are you guys up to? And he said, oh, you know, just trying to make a difference. And I said, oh, you should come visit. I'm at Gerard. And I had just left Haverford School and you know, I was eager beaver. I was trying to like solve all, solve, solve all the world's problems in a day. Yeah. And I uh, had him come on to campus and uh, and I showed him, you know, so Gerard sits on 43 acres, probably using 10% of his physical plant. Um, at one point had almost 1,800 students. When I arrived in 2015, they were down to like 220. Um, so it was oh a, my goodness! 
Yeah, it was it was dramatic drop in enrollment. Some of it was um, self, you know, self self directed, but you know they were they were on the mend, and you know the the economic uh, you know collapse in two thousand and eight, I think, beat up a lot of institutions, and Gerard was not um, excluded from that. You know that 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 hit, and uh, and so when I got there, you know, I got there in the middle of a firestorm, basically, <laughs> because mm-hmm. they were mauling over suspending the high school and suspending the residential programs. And so I was like, partner, partner, partner. And, uh, you know, I figure out a way to have smart partnerships. And so the, co- the call to, to, to Keith and A Better Chance was really about, okay, let's look at our missions and figure out if there's any synergies. And so ABC ended up moving on the campus at Girard. They went directly above my admissions team. Every single family that was in the A Better Chance program saw Girard College first, mm-hmm. right? So that was great for us. So that the admissions funnel widened and there were more yep. students that were looking that were, you know, pretty mission mission appropriate. And so that was uh that was exciting. And they also, you know, there was a you know, there was a fee associated with them living on campus. And so that that's institutional advancement in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I want to replicate that model, right? Well, and you know, input the revolution at the time, Revolution Project, who mm-hmm. was looking for this innovative school and so they came in I'll never forget um, I had this great table in my uh, in my office suite and uh, we met with the team from Revolution it was Gina it was Gina Moore is our uh, benefactor and uh, founder and she is just a dynamic professional uh, yeah, mm-hmm. I give her credit more of an educator than she be- than she realizes uh, <laughs> he's teaching us a ton um, and, and, and not in kind of those traditional markers, but I think, you know, I think that's been, that's been tr- tremendous and I've learned, I've learned a lot, but it was Gina there, Tom McManus, who was at uh, Mid-Pacific in Hawaii, uh, Noel Kellick was at the Philadelphia School, Jane Shore, um, our current head of uh, research and innovation, um, I think some others that were, that were present at that. I mean, Jenna Crocs were just a, re- a remarkable marketing person so we had a we had a great team come in give a great pitch about you know the model that they were working on at the same time I was at Penn and you know my work at Penn as a university mentor is really about geeking out and just staying Mm. current what's going on in education so it's kind of like all right I'm gonna I'm gonna stay current in theory and then you know I'll as a head of school I'll be in practice at the time I was vice president so um so when they came in and they gave their pitch on project-based, place-based learning, really unpacked their model, I said they're absolutely right, and 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 we should we should have a move on campus at Girard. We should have two schools mm. on campus. And so I, I ran the yeah, idea. Yeah, why not? Up, right. I ran the idea up the flagpole. I thought Girard's 170-year-old model was you know a little dated, a little antiquated. <laughs> uh, so uh, I thought you know we would benefit from each other. Um, I thought Gerard would teach revolution a ton. Um, mm-hmm. I thought he would teach Gerard a ton. And, uh, and I thought it could be a really, really interesting partnership. Everybody seemed to like the idea, but uh, I think it was moving a little slower than if you know Gina, she's, you know, she, she moves pretty quickly. And mm-hmm. uh, that, that conversation never really stopped. But in the middle of the conversation, uh, we started to have a conversation about uh, my joining the team and uh, one thing led to another and I ended up joining the team as the head of school, um, which I was not anticipating. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I just kind of, you know, transitioned to the, into that raw. I, yeah, I seem to recall a meeting where I thought I was going for pizza and a conversation of, around pizza <laughs> thing. <laughs> My, to, you know, to my involvement and my, you know, my direct involvement in the project and end up transitioning out of Gerard. And uh, you know, I can, I, ju- I, I can yeah. just imagine this moment where you, uh, you know, run over to Stantucci's or something like that, come back in 20 minutes later, pizza in hand and sit down and they're like, so we've been talking about you being head of school. And you're like, what? <laughs> just went for pizza, guys. It's not that serious. <laughs> something else i mean i was i had a lot of balls in the air at gerard as i'm sure started. we did with a better chance a better chance is still on campus there um, we had started a, a partnership between the philadelphia school and gerard called dreams diversity resilience engineering english arts math and science um, sponsored mm. by a gentleman by the name of will abel who graduated 
Howard College and, uh, and he and his wife, Joan, just tremendous philanthropists. They gave, uh, I think they just did the largest gift at her sinus that was around 11 million. But they- Oh my supported, goodness. Yeah, they supported the Dreams Program at Girard. Um, and that was, that was tremendous. And I had just finished, I, I, honestly, I, I feel like I just finished writing a proposal for that. <laughs> right. <laughs> For pizza, and uh, I guess it was just really good pizza. Must have been, yeah, yeah. That's that's the that's the trick, right? If you can find the good pizza shop, you'll uh, you'll make it into your uh, your benefactor's heart, I suppose. <laughs> so. Well, super interesting story, um, for sure, uh, and we could we could we could continue to talk about that for for a while. Um, I think one thing that I'm most curious about is there probably are a number of teachers that listen to this or educators in general. So it could be teachers, administrators, you know, could be whomever, grad students. And I think that there's a lot of movement and thought these days about starting new schools. Um, because you know, I was just having this conversation with a friend recently. You can, if you're, if you're really sort of like entrenched in a district or in a large school, you can probably try to affect some change. You know, maybe you're trying to do more project-based learning in your curriculum. Maybe you're trying to incorporate more strategic partnerships as you're talking about. And that could definitely work at your large school. But, you know, really to create transformational um, school opportunities for students, that's really challenging. And, and to try to do that at like, let's say you're, um, you know, at Gratz High School here in, in uh, Philadelphia, there's really, I think, only one model or one way that that has happened. And that's like school turnaround, right? Which is like whole scale, bring in a new model and try to implement that at, with, you know, 2000 kids. And that has its whole other host of challenges. But I know a lot of educators who are interested in kind of taking the road that revolution has taken. And that's like, let's create revolutionary and transformational experiences for a small group of students, work on that tightly for a while, and then work on scaling that afterwards. But I think that there's a there's like a threshold of uh, risk number one, um, but number two, like how do I actually operationalize this vision I have here into a thing? And so, can you kind of walk me through that? How did the Revolution Project move from Revolution Project to Revolution School? Um, with a with a with a tremendous amount of support, love, courage energy, mm. um, talent, time, treasure. I mean, I could just throw out a, probably a gazillion <laughs> words to the market. Um, the, the leading word I think is courage because it is, you know, it does, it does take some, you know, some, some, some risk that you mm -hmm. have to, um, you know, what, what I, a thought I had recently, um, was that, you know, when, um, the school I graduated from, the Haverford School, uh, is really about preparing boys for life. I spent um, my high school career there, and I spent uh, seven, almost eight years there as a professional. I was, uh, I was first the associate director of admissions, and then I ran the admissions office for six, I think, six years. While I was mm -hmm. doing that, I was also the head basketball coach, so I was a little crazy uh, yeah. to have those jobs and responsibilities, the seasonality of the basketball season and when admissions heats up is, almost, <laughs> you know, that, that's not typically what professionals do is they don't, right. they don't <laughs> but I did. Um, and, uh, you know, when you look at the, uh, the DNA, when you look at the original mission statements at schools like have a, right. And this is a school that transformed, you know, transformed me for sure. Um, mm -hmm. I have to give credit to the people, and this is why I say that people are the program, because it's not the bricks and mortar that transform the lives of students. The people transform the lives of students. The educator does that, right? And so I remember when I got to Haverford in 2008, 
you know, I, I, I used the, the, the lyric that we were in, we, we, we had just finished like a $40 million renovation of, of the upper school. So it was an easy building to set. Yeah. Easy building. Now imagine showing up after finishing a renovation project in 2008 and COVID-19 hits. You, oh, better have, you better have something else to bet on. Mm-hmm. And that's something for your people, right? And so I think we've grown accustomed to, um, you know, the bricks and mortar side of it, you know, and I, I know obviously there's a social emotional component where we want to meet and we want to interact and engage in person. But I think part of the advantage of um, being small, being nimble um, right now is just the ability to, to, to pivot quickly in, in ways that I think larger organizations uh, are, are challenged. You know, I'd hate to be in a scenario planning committee at a, a school with 500, 600, 1,000, 2,500 kids to account for. Um, and, and, yeah. so, and, and oh, by the way, nothing stops us from replicating really strong micro schools. So if you, you come up with a model that is tried and true, tested and proven after four years, six years, eight years, 10 years, then you, know, you can be really intentional and thoughtful about replicating that model. And you can have a series of micro schools, potentially. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that I'd love to see us do at Revolution, and we're, we've been thinking about this in the back of our head, is how do we replicate our model? I think when you lead with that question, how, and infused in that question is also why, I think you can come up with some really good solutions. Um, but it really starts with the people. Um, I think, you know, the way we got to where we are, you know, I think, you know, Gina's tremendous gift uh, to to seed the school, followed by um, you know Ellen Schwartz and Jeremy Siegel, um, you know Michael Foreman, Gen- uh, Jennifer Rice. Um, you know we we've just had tremendous tremendous support um, to to get us in, in the position that we are um, that we're in now, and so the the hard work you know from where we are now moving forward is uh, is 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 the reality of a, a scrappy startup, and you know if if. If nothing else comes out of this, um, I think what we've been able to do successfully is inspire, you know, other folks like you, like others that are in different programs to, you know, to carry the carry the water and keep, you know, keep it, you know, keep it moving and, and keep the momentum going. Um, I think there's a line, the rising tide lifts all boats, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and one of my teammates, Tom McManus, used to say all the time. And I just think that's important. You know, I think that's an important way to look at it. And, um, you know, we, we intend to be really successful. Um, but in the event that, you know, things don't go as well as we anticipate that they will, um, I think we've inspired a, a generation of educators and, and thoughtful leaders to, you know, to push the word forward. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I love what you're saying. And one of my big, I think, takeaways, and I knew this for sure before this conversation, is you've talked here, you know, we've we've been talking for a little over half an hour or something like that. So much of your emphasis has been on team, 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 you know, and coming from a former Hooper or, you know, active Hooper, whatever, (laughs) no judgment, you know. Um, I'm inactive right now. I was trying to play uh, roughhouse with my kids. (laughs) Came down on my ankle and I got a bad wheel right now. I show it to you, but I think you lose the hands, lose some. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think what you're saying is that if you're a teacher listening to this episode right now and you're thinking, man, I would really love to start up my own micro school, go out, find your team those people that are going to support you. And sometimes, you you, you know, um, you may have some like initial people that are on your team that are your thought partners, and there's a process there that's really valuable. Sometimes those people kind of come and go from your team, but those core members, those other people that you know are going to, you know, bootstrap and do that hard work with you, um, that's super, super critical. If you don't get your team in place, um, or think about yourself as not a lone wolf, right? That you got to go about this with a team. So if, as people may come and go, that you're holding the torch, but also bringing people on to hold it with you all the time, that um, that's one of your, your uh, if I'm picking this up correctly, one of your like critical aspects to the 
early stages of success for revolution. I think so. And I also think there's a, there's a disposition that you have to have um, mm -hmm. one uh, growth mindset, but I'm a, a big habits of mind guy. Um, I think there's two leading um, habits of mind for me that, that I've adopted and kind of married, myself, which is, you know, it's really important to listen with understanding and empathy. Um, you know, if you look around the world right now, part of the challenge that we're having is we're not listening very well. Um, yeah. You know, the, the ability to have a courageous conversation after you haven't listened is impossible. Um, and so I think, you know, listening with understanding and empathy is, is, is the mark of, I think, good leadership. I also think you have to think flexibly. Once you listen with understanding and empathy, you have to have the ability to think, um, you know, have, have flexible thinking there. And, 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 and so I've, I've tried to do that. And I think what that does is it creates uh, conditions of trust, which I think is another huge and important ingredient in starting anything. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what we try to do on the culture side, and this is all culture work, right? What mm -hmm. we try to do on the side is make sure that we have those dispositions, we're pushing each other, we're asking why, when we put together our, um, our hiring process for a new staff full team, I had this rubric that I made in grad school. I thought it was great. And <laughs> it landed us some pretty talented folks. And this is during my time at Girard. And I think I started um, with this rubric in, at Haverford. And it was, yeah, it's definitely at Haverford because I was in grad school um, when, when I, during, my, during my tenure at Haverford. And so I, I kept it with me, carried it with me. I think I got a good grade for it. So I thought it was tested. And uh, so I was going to use it. And we were in kind of a a quick uh, a quick hiring process. We had to you know execute this hire in probably two or three weeks. Mm. So we put put the committee together. We put the team together, and I shared this rubric. And uh, our head of research and innovation, Jane, you know, got it, and she asked like a thousand questions. Basically, took the thing apart. <laughs> uh, and I tell you, if, if I didn't listen and just have the you know that that kind of mindset of you know what, she's absolutely right. She's put together a really good rubric. She's, you know, taken the best of what I had in mind and, and infused it and built something better. Um, mm. I think it's important. And, and I think what it immediately sets up is conditions for trust and that we trust each other. She knows that if she brings an idea to me as the head of school, I'm not going to reject it. In fact, I'm going to say, hey, let me, you know, let me take a closer look at that. And I just think that's really important. And that's how you build yeah. strong. Um, you know, when, when you don't have that mindset, when you don't have that disposition, especially when you're hiring talented people, you know, um, all-star teams are tricky because everybody's used to having a ball mm. and shoot. Um, and so you got to be careful when you build a, an all-star team, you got to have folks that are willing to play roles too. And, uh, and so I think we've done a nice job with that. Um, has it been perfect? Absolutely not. We've had turnover. We've had transition. I think that's natural. Um, you know, attrition is natural in startups and you have to, you have to plan for that and just be, you know, brace yourself for that. But if you hold the students at the center, you, you hold your mission and your core values, um, and they're on, they're on strong footing. Uh, I think you'll, 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 you'll find real success. Yeah. I think the golden state warriors would agree with you, right? Having an all-star team is super challenging unless you got the coach that can come in there and really kind of say, Hey, like we're all in this for students and for our values. That's why we're all here. So let's figure out how we can work together. And that might mean that some people don't stay on the team and that's okay too. You know, like you said, attrition is natural and, and usual for startups. Um, so you call out the warriors. It, it, it calls to mind the mark of a, a really good leader. I think a lot of people probably watched the, the last dance and they look at Michael Jordan as a leader. And obviously he was a different kind of leader. Mm -hmm. uh, you, might, you might call Michael a, a transactional leader. You might call Steve Kerr a transformational leader, or you might mm -hmm. have arguments about the kind of leaders they are. That's what I took from the last dance. I thought it was like a, a, a master's class on different styles of leadership. Um, and, you know, I think what, what you have in, in, in Steve Kerr, when you look at what he's been able to do or what he was able to do uh, with the Warriors and why he was successful, he won. He won at the highest level. Yeah. You know, and I think when you have that, you know, that, that experience, that pedigree of winning at a really high level, you know what it takes, you know, you have that ability. And I think that that's been, um, that's been pretty impressive to, to watch and observe that. And, you know, I don't think you can discount uh, having folks on your team that have been successful. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 
So one of the ways that I found out about the Revolution School um, is I was just like searching around Philadelphia for interesting schools that are doing interesting things. And boom, I land on this beautiful website, which is, you know, shout out to your media team. That thing is on point for sure. But one of the yeah. other things that I found um, in my search was that Revolution was really putting time and energy into sharing student stories and highlighting the things that were happening within the school. And I, I was talking with, um, with Big Picture Learning along with our co-hosts in, in our previous episode. And, and you know, it's so interesting. I mentioned that school is one of the most veiled experiences that people have. You know, you and I understand what happens in schools because we're education professionals. We work in them every day. But if we were to go to like the VP of JP Morgan and say, hey, you know, like, what do you think happens in a school? And that guy or that, that person, I should say, has been, you know, working in, in their role at JP Morgan for probably 30 years. You know, they had a school experience back in whatever the 80s or the 90s. So they have a vision about what school is all about. But what Revolution is trying to do is so different from that JP Morgan VP's experience, you know? And so one of the efforts that I have really appreciated is like, y'all are trying to really put it out there. Like, this is what school is about at Revolution. And if you try to think about school like it was 30 years ago, you're not gonna get it. Like, that's not what's happening here. So talk to me about how you guys have tried to use your, your media outreach and your storytelling to really get the revolution message into the community. So uh, we've got a tremendous uh, consultant group we work with, uh, Them Collaborative, um, mm. the, that supports the marketing and communications function, someone by the name of Jenna Croxford, who has been unreal um, in her ability to organize and coordinate our story. Um, and, you know, making sure that that story is consistent with our mission and core values and puts the students at the center. And, um, and so, you know, after that, the results are pretty much, pretty much an offshoot of just having the right foundation. Um, mm -hmm. So you got the right person in the chair to help coordinate and facilitate the story. You have the mission and the core values that support what you're doing, you have, you know, for example, you know, we, we're working on a project right now. This is a sneak preview. Um, you know, the theme for this year is going to be going viral, right? So we have right now decided we're going to think about, talk about COVID-19. We're going we're gonna to think about, talk about the epidemic back in 1793, the yellow fever ep epidemic. Um, mm -hmm. Philly. We're going to look at the pandemic of racism. And you know what's happening with the Black Lives Matter and how things go viral. As soon as you say going viral, kids start thinking about TikTok and they start thinking about you know what's happening in their world. So it's our way of meeting kids where they are. But if there's not unlimited potential in which depth in that you know going viral theme, I, I'm not sure what is. And mm -hmm. you know we talk to the kids about it, we talk to the students about it, and in that conversation. Jenna is present and ready to share reactions of what the kids say and, and what they think and, um, and how we communicate, you know, what, what we're going to be doing. And so I think that's what it comes down to is you have to be authentic in, 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 in what, you're, what you're saying and doing. And um, I think it resonates, you know, because I think especially with educators, if there's a, a bone to pick for me with our, with our, uh, with our website or with our content. I think it's, um, someone described it as being catnip for educators, right? I <laughs> sure, be, yeah. I wanted to be, I also, I also wanted to be catnip for students and prospective students. I also want yeah. to be catnip for prospective parents that, you know, would say, well, I'm not sure about this model. How are you going to teach math and project-based learning, right? Um, so I wanted to be catnip for them as well. I wanted to be catnip for that corporate exec that feels like they want to give uh, support uh, to, to, to our work. Um, and so uh, I joke with Jane all the time because, you know, in the spirit of like just high level, you know, education speak, she's probably at the top of the food chain. Mm -hmm. And so what I 
saying to her, and I'm a, I'm a hip hop fan, so I'm, I'm a Nas and Jay-Z guy, right? Um, I, think, I think Nas is the best ever, but Jay-Z might be my favorite. Okay, and okay. And I'm a big fan of Jay- Jay-Z is because he breaks it down in real simple forms. You know exactly what he's saying. Nas is like, you know, yep. way up. And uh, so, I, so I joke with, with Jane and, and I joke with other teammates and saying, you got to be a little more Jay-Z and a little less Nas. <laughs> telling this story and, um, and sharing, you know, sharing our work. And that way, it's, it, you know, it's um, easier for the public to digest, right? It's, it's more for public consumption. Yeah. Um, and so that's an area where we're trying to grow, where we're trying to get better in, in telling our story. And I think we're, uh, I think we're getting there, uh, but it takes time again, point of, you know, evolving and trying to get better and um, learning from, you know, learning from experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we always like to kind of move into the last couple segments of our episode um, with a little bit of a reflection, you know, um, and I would love to offer you the opportunity to kind of reflect on this conversation, your experience as an educator, and whatever you would like really to maybe give a little bit of time for how either this, is, this conversation or any of your experiences have made you kind of rethink uh, what education is really all about. And I'll share a little bit about what's coming up for me in this conversation is I already mentioned this earlier about your emphasis on teams. And I think that's really critical. You know, educators got to have that group of people that they can, um, that they can really go to. I uh, have recently called them uh, your board of directors, right? Like, so everybody has their own board of directors and who's on your board of directors is a question I'm asking students all the time. And a question I'm asking my colleagues all the time. Um, And I think that, uh, education professionals really just got to go out there and do it. You know, there's a, there is a lot of risk for sure. You know, a lot of um, teachers are parents. A lot of teachers, you know, have life partners, whatever. And so it can be scary to take on the risk of a, of a place like a, like a revolution school. But we all know that teaching and learning has to be transformed for students. It has to be. We know that the future is going to be and is very different for students. And if we don't address that as schools, we're not helping our young people, which is really at the heart of reason of the reason why we got into education in the first place, right? Um, and so if we're not taking those steps to make some transformational change, then like, what are we doing, you know? and it is scary. You know, I've toiled with starting new schools for a while now. And part of my struggle with that is that, um, you know, I got student loan payments to make and I got people in my life I got to support. And that's super, that's super challenging. But trying to really grapple with that and kind of um, work with your team to, to overcome that risk, because when you work with other people, the risk seems less risky than if you're just doing it on your own, you know, um, that can, that's, I think that's really important. So if you're listening out there to this episode, I just want to encourage you to like grapple with that risk, you know, and really name it, say, this is scary because it, it, it is, and then go after it and say, why is it scary? How can I make it not as scary for myself? Because we all know that our kids need um, you know, need transformational learning opportunities. And a lot of them are not getting it in their, in their current school uh, environments. So what, 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 you'll, what you'll come across in, in the work that I've engaged in over the last couple of years is educators like yourself um, who are really, really interested in making a difference that understand the urgency of transforming um, how we do school. Um, mm. the, the best way to describe what we're doing, rethinking, transforming, I think there's a lot of words we can throw out there. I think it's modernizing education. Yeah, um, yeah. From, a, from, a, from a professional that I was talking with a couple of months ago. And she said, you know, what I'm watching you guys do and what I'm seeing and what I've, I've, I've observed of your work is you're really modernizing education that no, the, you know, 
the, the, the cell phone is, has replaced the, the, the rotary, the rotary, right? Like we're not using those anymore. <laughs> you know, so the, ed, so, so the classrooms have to be updated, right? And, and we, you know, we were forced to update the classroom now where, where everything's virtual, right? And so, you know, if you don't evolve, if you don't have the ability to shift, um, you know, if you don't have those, those power skills and, you know, that growth mindset and, um, the ability to think flexibly and problem solve, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be left in the dust. And that's just the reality. And I think the biggest challenge that we're having right now in our education system is that we, you know, we've done things the same way for a really long time. We're comfortable with that selfishly gravitate to going back to that. And it doesn't really work that mm -hmm. well. And who is most affected by it are our students. And, and so that, that's where you have to just really, I think, um, center yourself and, and stay, you know, stay focused and, and not be distracted by, you know, maybe there's some political things happening and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in the spirit of scenario planning. and everybody's scenario plan. Everybody wants to get back into the Sure. Well, because that's what we're used to, right? I mean, I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm just sure that, that that's viable. It's not safe, right? Yeah. So we want to because that's what we're used to, but forgetting that it's unsafe, right? And, and that is a vaccine. And so one of the calls, and you know, let me let me be clear, if I was at a larger organization, I've worked 90% of my career at large organizations, I'd have a different plan. You know, I, sure. walked, into, I walked into a virtual board meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago, month, maybe a month and a half ago, and I presented this idea of sponsoring tuition for the 2020-21 academic calendar year. Mm -hmm. And um, at first blush, you're like, this guy is nuts. But what I am is I'm thinking about our founding families that committed to us before we had a building, before we had scaffolding hired, um, that they were early adopters in, in like every sense of the word and they had faith in us and they put tremendous faith in, in, in what we were gonna do and they believed in the people. And so, you know, we have to believe in them and, 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 and try to pay it yeah. forward to the we can. And fortunately, we were in a position where, you know, because we weren't going to go to a thousand kids, next year was kind of kind of bought and paid for. Yeah. So the ability yeah. to you can add four, five, six, seven more kids to our model that are good fits and that, 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 that are a good match mission wise. And uh, I think that, you know, I think that's a, a tremendous opportunity to put out there. And I think what it does is it buys a tremendous amount of equity. I think there's some residual benefits there. I think it buys a tremendous amount of equity in our families. We had, you know, when we announced it, a couple of our families said, you know, they wanted to transition their tuition to a donation to the school mm. um, because we had, we had made that gesture. And we weren't thinking about that. We weren't thinking in terms of transactions. We were thinking about how do we support our community? How do we establish the culture that we want to establish and, uh, and you know, create the environment that we want to create? And I think, um, fortunately that, you know, that that's happened. It's also, you know, been interesting to hear from families that otherwise may not have considered independent schools, uh, because we have a plan. And so, you know, I was talking to a family uh, yesterday and I didn't talk about the tuition sponsorship until the end of the call. I almost forgot to tell them <laughs> I, I talked about the fact that we have a plan for, for September. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that was what, that's what was most comforting, right? That yeah. we have a plan you know, here's, here's the theme of the program. This is why we're using this theme. This is our model. This is why this is our model. I went over Jedi, the whole thing. And, uh, and they got pretty fired up about it. And I said, Oh, by the way, next year, we're going to sponsor the tuition. And they're like, you're kidding me. I was like, no, we, you know, we're, that's what we do. And, uh, so, but if I was at a larger school, different context, there's no way I walk in a, walk in a boardroom and do that. I get fired immediately, but it was. <laughs> right. And so I think the, the lesson in that Mike is that, all of our context can be different. What you do at Revolution is different than what you're going to do at Big Picture. Is different than what you're going to do at the Haver for School. Is different than your, what you're going to do at Gerard College, right? Mm. Different context call for you know different playbooks, right? So you know, as a coach, you know when we played Malvern, I knew that they were going to run and gun and shoot a lot of threes. Mm -hmm. when we played uh, Episcopal. I knew they were going to slow it down and be more more methodical. So we had to have different plays, different games that we showed up and, and competed in. And I think, you know, similarly, 
as uh, as organizational leaders, as educators, as folks that are running big, you know, big corporate corporations, um, you got to have a you got to have a play. You got to have a plan um, for the environment that you're in, and uh, you got to be able to adapt. And if you don't, and if you don't have the ability to adapt, I think you're gonna put yourself, and I think you're gonna put your organization in a tough spot. Yeah, that's great. That's super super helpful advice and very insightful and very much appreciative. Um, so at the end of every episode, we usually uh, share something that we've been reading or listening to or talking about. We call it our plug section. And uh, I would love to hear something you're kind of, uh, you know, just getting into recently. It could be education related or not. What do you got for me? It's stale now. It was uh, for us our, a big big part of our inspiration was uh, Ted Venter Smith and Tony Wagner most likely to succeed. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Well, that was, that was a big one for us. Um, I, I got to give a plug to my, to my six just turned seven year old who, um, who forced <laughs> me out, who was forcing me out of the house to ride bikes. I mean, I haven't been on a bike for like 10 years or something like that, but like we're riding bikes and, you know, just enjoying our, ourselves and, and enjoying each other as a family. Um, I think I should, I think everybody should be plugging that idea. Um, take advantage of this time. You know, this this the moment that we're in is, is a tough one. Um, you know, I, I, I tell you what, the 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 reading that I'm doing now and all the things that I'm doing now are completely different than what I was doing six months ago, right? Like, yeah, I can cook a little better. Like, I grill more. Like, I, you know, I got all these things. Like, the, it's like the world sped up and slowed down at the same time. And in a slowing down, I, I've been able to learn. Um, so that, that's, that's been kind of cool. And I'll tell you that the kind of last parting uh, word of wisdom that I'll share that is not my own is I, I had a, a, a actually, actually a, a, a person that is a close friend of revolution said to me, he said, look, he said, you know, Henry he said, uh, you know, generals are made in, uh, in wars, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, so it takes a great battle to make a, a general, a, a, good, a good general. And, you know, he was saying that in the context of our organization, that this could be that big war, this could be that big opportunity um, for us. And, and and he didn't mean it as an opportunity or for us to be opportunistic. He was saying it as a matter of fact, like if you look historically, yeah. you know, different things, then that, you know, that's that's what happened. And he said, he's just trying to give me silver lining. And I think every, every organizational leader right now could use some silver lining, <laughs> so. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I we could we could talk about that for uh, for a long time. I'm a big history person. So I definitely appreciate that. Uh, that statement. I think I'm going to plug. Um, yeah, I love the ride a bike plug. I don't think we've ever had anybody plug like an action. But I love that. Uh, so I'm going to drop in our I'm going to drop in our description a couple of my favorite local bike stores. Um, and uh, you know, if you're listening to this episode, feel free to to check those out. I actually, I actually have another one. David Epstein's um, book Range. Uh, you should check it out. I mean, it's it's neat. It it, it goes through. It's kind of the antithesis of uh, uh, Malcolm Gladwell's Thousand Hours thing. Um, it it, it kind of goes in the opposite direction. It says that you should have more range and that you should have a lot more experiences um, that'll make you, you know, more prepared for different scenarios uh, if you if you've had different experiences. And so it does a, a really interesting contrast in the beginning of Tiger Woods, who had a golf club in his hand since he was three, and Roger mm-hmm. Federer, who um, wouldn't, you know, wouldn't play tennis with him, and she was a tennis instructor, and mm-hmm. so. Better obviously turned out to be a really good tennis player, and you know, Tiger Woods is pretty good too, right? So it's just an interesting <laughs> how, um, and how the two athletes kind of came to. Um, and and so, you know, Roger Federer, I didn't know this, he played like every sport in the, in, in, in the book, and uh, uh and interesting, Tiger Woods specialized, <clears throat> specialized. Mm-hmm. so that was a really interesting thing, um, for me in particular because I specialized in basketball. Um, you know, and it's interesting when authors write and you see some of the cultural competence stuff come out. Uh, so for, for me, when I interpreted some of the, uh, you know, some of the takeaways of the book, one question that I had and the question that I, I, I asked, um, you know, the author is David Epstein is, you know, if all you have is a basketball and a court, 
right? You don't have a membership to a golf club or you don't have right. lacrosse sticks and the gear. Or an ice rink. Ice rink. Right. Like, it's hard to have range in 10 different sports if, you know, five of them cost $1,000 per to play and that's not the resource that you have access yeah. to. Um, I had my ball in my hoop and I met my two legs and arms. I could walk down to the court and I could shoot and work on my game. Um, so I specialized because that's that's the tool I had, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. up doors for me. So, um, so I think it's an interesting read. There's a lot of cool lessons, uh, cool takeaways there. And uh, I definitely plug that one. Cool. I'll, I'll for sure check it out and we'll definitely drop a link to that in, um, in our podcast description. My plug is for um, Jason Reynolds and Ibram X. Kendi's newest book, Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You, a remix of the National Book Award winning Stamped from the beginning. Um, and I just ordered my copy. It's a young adult version of the original Stamped uh, by um, Dr. Kendi. The original Stamped is about 550 pages long, and it's, you know, this mix of uh, history and memoir and, and a little bit of, uh, you know, academic writing. And so um, Kendi partnered with Jason Rendell Reynolds to produce the, you know, young adult version of Stamped so we can so we can provide access to that for our young people in our schools. My hope is that I'll kind of uh, sift through that and really take it in over the next couple months and then figure out how I can incorporate that into my, you know, education work this fall. Um, so I'm hoping to hoping to snag onto that, uh, that book in the next like week or so and, and dive in and see what I come up with. But Henry Fairfax, listen, it's been a super, super privilege to be able to chat with you today and to be able to put out this podcast to our um, to our listeners. For everybody listening out there, I hope that you enjoyed our conversation with Henry. Um, you can check out his school, The Revolution School. The uh, link will be in our podcast description. And um, thanks again, Henry. Hey, happy to be here. Uh, thank you to all the, all of the listeners and uh, hopefully some folks will check out what we're doing and continue to listen and listen into your podcast. This is pretty awesome. Thank you. And just a quick thing before we leave this podcast, if you've been keeping up with us, we're trying to get to 1000 downloads um, and we would love it if you could share our podcast with other folks that you know, people that might be interested in education. We're at about 800 downloads right now, so we're kind of making it happen, but we would love to see that extra boost come with this episode um, and our interview with Henry or uh, other episodes that you really love. We also were just added to Pandora's new podcast database. So check us out on Pandora. Head on over to our website, rethinkingedu.co. Leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts. We would love to hear from you. Shoot us an email. And as always, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.